This tutorial is designed to show students how to apply the F hypothesis test. The F test is a formal hypothesis test that is designed to deal with a null hypothesis that contains multiple hypotheses or a single hypothesis about a group of coefficients. Such a joint or compound hypothesis are appropriate whenever underlying economic theory specifies values for multiple coefficients simultaneously. So for instance, in a Cobb-Douglas production function, where the returns to capital and labor are assumed to be constant, we are assuming that the alpha and beta values for capital and labor sum to one. So we are imposing alpha plus beta equal to one as a hypothesis. The F test is operationalized essentially by estimating two or more equations. This we come with a restricted model and an unrestricted model. The restricted model is essentially the model assumed under the null hypothesis and has some restriction imposed on it, while the unrestricted model is the model assumed under the alternative hypothesis. So for instance in the Cobb-Douglas production function, the restricted model has the null hypothesis that the alpha and beta equals 1, or constant returns to scale. The alternative hypothesis is that alpha plus beta does not equal 1 and that the returns to scale are not constant. The hypotheses are essentially placing constraints on the equations which we want to estimate. As a result, the null hypothesis for the f-test always leads to a constrained equation. So we will always have some restriction imposed in the null hypothesis and this will be a constrained or restricted equation. The second stage to the f-test after we've designated our known alternative hypothesis and specified our constricted and unconstricted equation is to estimate these two models, and then we compare the fit of them. If the fits of the constrained equation and unconstrained equation are not significantly different, then the null hypothesis should not be rejected. This essentially states that the constrained equation explains the data just as well as the unconstrained equation, and as a result the unconstrained equation provides no additional explanatory power, and there is no need to apply it. If the fit of the unconstrained equation is significantly better than the constrained equation, then we reject the null hypothesis. This is saying that if we ignore the restriction imposed, the predictive power of our model is improved st statistically significantly, and we should use the unconstrained equation. We note that it's impossible for the fit of the constrained equation to be better than the fit of the unconstrained equation due to the fact that when we have an unconstrained equation which adds additional variables or does not impose any restrictions on the parameters, this will reduce the sum of squared error in the model, essentially improving the fit. To illustrate what we mean by a constrained and unconstrained equation, we're going to use a wage equation example as such, where we say wage depends on hours, age, education and experience, and we do associated coefficients. We also have an intercept term and an error value. We say beta naught is the intercept, beta 1 through 4 are the slope coefficients, and e is our error term. So let us suppose that we believe education and experience have no impact on the wages a person earns. What we are essentially stating here is that these coefficients equal 0, i.e. they have no impact on wage. So beta 3 and beta 4 are equal to 0. We specify this in the null hypothesis of beta 3 equals beta 4 equals 0. After we've constrained these two equations, this results in the following model being specified as our constrained equation, where wages are just equal to hours and age. The education and experience of someone has no impact on their wage. So beta 3 and beta 4 are effectively 0 and drop out of our constrained model. The first equation is the unconstrained equation, as we've set no constraints on the coefficients, while the second equation at the top of this slide is the constrained equation, as we've set the constraint that beta 3 and beta 4 are equal to 0. The idea behind the f-test is that if the sum of squared errors are substantially different, then the assumption imposed by the constraint has significantly reduced the ability of the model to fit the data, and thus the data does not support the constraint. When we've estimated both the restricted and unrestricted models, we can calculate the f statistic from the sum of squared errors of the two models. So the fit of the models are compared using the f test as specified here. 
where we see the f test is equal to the sum of squared errors of the restricted model minus the sum of squared errors of the unrestricted model divided by j. This is all over the sum of squared errors of the unrestricted model divided by n minus k. We specify all these values as the sum squared error of the restricted model is equal to the sum of the squared errors once we estimate the model. Again, most statistical software will produce this for you. For instance, Stata will provide the sum of the squared errors as will um, SPSS. Sum of squared errors UR represents the sum of squared errors from our unrestricted estimation. J is the number of restrictions we introduce in our null hypothesis. So in the instance of this example, we are assuming that beta 3 equals beta 4 equals 0. So we're counting equal signs and saying there's two restrictions. N is the number of observations. So this is the total number of surveys conducted or time periods considered. And K is the number of estimated coefficients in the unrestricted model. Essentially, you're counting the number of betas which you have estimated. The critical F value is determined from the statistical tables and depends on the level of significance chosen by the researcher and the degrees of freedom. Unlike a t-statistical test, the F critical has two types of degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom of the numerator, given by J in the previous example, so i.e the number of restrictions imposed, and the degrees of freedom for the denominator, which is n minus k, the number of observations minus the parameters in the unrestricted model. Again, what we need to do is compare the value for the calculated f, given the formula previously, and look at this relative to the critical value. If the calculated f is greater than the critical f, we, do, we reject the null hypothesis, and we do not reject a null hypothesis if the F calculated is less than the F critical. That concludes this tutorial, a tutorial on how to use the F statistical tables to obtain a critical value is also uploaded to YouTube.